Shion was never meant to exist, neither in the game world nor in real life. According to a 2009 interview translated by KH Insider, series creator Tetsuya Nomura needed a way to get Roxas out of the organization so he could set the stage for Kingdom Hearts 2. And like Xehanort, when he was trying to come up with a way to spur this teenage boy to action, he thought, what if he liked a girl, and then I killed her? Enter Shion, born to die! Shion and Roxas are two of a kind. Both of them owe their existence to Sora and in time have to return it to him. So Yoko Shimomura wrote both of their musical themes to be really sad. Wow. We also have to talk about Kairi's theme. Shion is made from Sora's memories of Kairi, so the two of them inherently share a link. Kairi's theme is titled Kairi, and Roxas's theme is titled Roxas, so it's only natural that Shion's theme is titled Musique pour la tristesse de Shion. Like a lot of Yoko Shimomura's music, this track has a lot of repetition in it, but not in a strict sense. Starting with a musical idea and then transforming it by changing the rhythm or putting it on a different instrument can bring new emotional colors out of the music. In the 13th struggle, we saw this philosophy applied really thoroughly. This is what that piece looks like as block-based composition, which is a term I just made up. We'll call it BBs. We'll call it block-based composition. The idea behind block-based composition is that by representing certain musical ideas with a colored block instead of sheet music, it can be much more intuitive to see how certain pieces of music are built. But this only works well with pieces that repeat most of their contents. Music pour la Jeez. Shion's theme is a little different, because it tends to repeat ideas more subtly instead of beat for beat. Like, the piano is almost always doing something that starts like this. But it can follow that up in one of three different ways. These three variations of the same idea are closely related enough that I think we can represent them all using the same block, but there are many parts of Shion's theme that only play once per loop. Giving blocks to phrases that don't repeat is kind of meaningless. But it's still worth talking about Shion's theme in terms of blocks like this because it gives us a way to identify some motifs that we're going to hear in other tracks. So we've got our red block, which is almost always on piano. and a blue block that mostly shows up on bells. And later in the piece, we'll hear this violin solo. But those are the only three blocks we're going to use, even though there's so much more to the piece than this. Because the main feature of Shion's theme is too small for block-based composition to represent. This piece of music is all about these four notes. This pattern is scattered all over the piece in various rhythms and keys. We're going to refer to this as Shion's motif, and we'll represent it with this icon. We're using numbers here instead of note names because the note names aren't consistent. At the beginning of the piece, we hear this as A, B flat, A, D. But by the end of the piece, it's F, G flat, F, B flat. Music takes its identity from the relationships between notes, not the notes themselves. There are 12 note names, and so 12 minor scales, and if you pick any of them and play the second, third, second, and fifth degree down an octave, you will hear Shion's motif. Okay, so let's check out where this shows up in the track. Oh my god! What? How? Why aren't we sick and tired of hearing this track by, like, measure three? Well, when we take a closer look, we see that Shion's motif is never just standing alone. It's always a conclusion to something else. And it's the something else that keeps changing. If you listen to these passages back to back, this repetition doesn't sound terribly repetitive. And plot twist, even though all three of those parts have different rhythms, they all play at the same time.
I know I just said note names don't matter, but we're going to talk about key changes now, so note names matter again. A little while after this, there are two key changes in quick succession. This chapter is going to deal with some advanced concepts, so don't feel bad if it doesn't click at first, and feel free to ask questions in the comments. Up till now, we've been in the key of G minor. By the time we get to this measure, the key has changed to E flat minor. But contrary to the sad minor key sounds that dominate this piece, the two measures in between the key changes are oddly bright because they're built on major chords. Here's what that sounds like. The funny thing is, since we're entering this part from G minor, holding out a G for a long time like this should sound like the piece might be ending, but it doesn't, not even a little bit, because of the D flats on the left hand. D flat and G don't get along because they're a tritone apart, a very dissonant interval. This is the first tritone of the piece, and the first D flat of the piece. It's an unexpected and slightly uncomfy sound that sabotages any resolution this G might otherwise have given us. The personality of the track changes here because this measure doesn't follow the patterns set before it, and it's not even totally clear what key it's in. When you combine those facts with the mostly major sounds that are present, that gives the phrase a quirky feeling. Because not every moment of Shion's life was miserable, which is much worse because it means she knows what she was missing. To bring us back down to earth, the second measure in this segue leads us into a new minor key with a secondary dominant chord. To oversimplify, the general idea of a secondary dominant is that it's a tense chord from outside the current key, whatever that is in this case, used to change our expectations for the following phrase. The root of the chord harmonizes well in the new key, and the other chord tones approach the new key's first degree, or tonic, from opposing directions. So every part of the secondary dominant helps the listener expect and accept the new key before it arrives. You can hear that this second key change feels like a transition to solid ground, even though we've never been in E-flat minor before. So, like I said, advanced concepts, but the whole reason we're talking about them is that the effects they have on the music aren't advanced. Any listener can feel the quirkiness of these two measures and the arrival that happens after them. Explaining this stuff is hard, but knowing it is easy. After we land in E-flat minor, we hear a unique line from the solo violin. If you were listening really carefully, you may have noticed something hiding in there. No, it's not Shion's motif. That is Kyrie's motif. Kyrie's motif goes 2, 3, 4, 5 in a minor scale, usually returning to 2 at the end. Let's talk about intellectual property for a second. When I say these four notes mean Shion, and these four notes mean Kyrie. I don't mean Shimomura snagged these patterns for herself and now no one else can use them. You can't trademark that, it's too simple. Trust me, a record company would have done it by now. When the melody in Against All Odds from Genshin Impact goes two, three, four, five in a minor scale, That's not a Kyrie reference. But Shion is very closely linked to Kyrie, so when Shion's theme goes 2, 3, 4, 5, we know without question that Shimomura is deliberately introducing Kyrie's theme. And then this crystally synth comes in, and I almost have to laugh because all it plays in this phrase is the two motifs. That completes Shion's theme. From there, we just loop in E-flat minor until it's time for the music to fade out. We haven't talked about what gives the music its sad character, but that part is deceptively simple. 
Shion's theme is in a minor key and has consonant harmonies as well as a slow tempo, soft articulation, and instruments that are good at sounding sad. None of those can make music sad by themselves, but together it's a sure bet. It's actually pretty easy to make music sad. The hard part is making it memorable, and that's especially important if the composer is trying to establish a leitmotif. Every time a soundtrack composer writes a melody that listeners can easily identify, they add to their toolbox of leitmotifs that can be used in powerful ways elsewhere in the soundtrack. Ten years later, in Kingdom Hearts 3, Axel and Shion meet for the first time in years, but Shion's memories are a jumbled, manipulated mess. Fortunately, Sora and friends have the power of friendship, so like, whatever, man. But seriously, check out how referencing her own work allows Shimomura to bring out the drama of this scene without saying a word. Changing sides again? We need him alive, you know that. We only need his heart in order to forge the key. We do not need his soul. Oh. But that's right. You were friends. Then, you take his life. <sighs> Who are you? Don't do this. It's all right. You can stop now. It's all right. Shion. The music in that scene hits, and only because we connect the sounds we're hearing to what we felt the last time we heard them. And it's not just Pavlovian. The music is dramatic and sad in ways we've already discussed, but when a listener catches musical references like this, they automatically compare what they're seeing on screen with what was happening other times they heard that motif. With motifs, composers can directly enhance a story in an instant. It's a powerful, nonverbal way to show the significance of a moment. But motifs are not magic spells that will always produce feels. If a composer references motifs too often, the listener may feel like they've run out of ideas. But more importantly, if recognizing a motif makes the listener think of other times they've heard it, and the composer uses the motif constantly, what exactly is the listener supposed to think of? This risk of overuse is probably why we almost never hear Dearly Beloved referenced in other Kingdom Hearts tracks. Shimomura knows that for thousands of players, Dearly Beloved is a profoundly iconic tune, so by saving it for key moments in the Kingdom Hearts canon, she preserves the nostalgia, earnesty, and promise of adventure that it has for so many of us. But hold that thought while I take a moment to thank my Patreon supporters. Everyone's generosity goes a long way toward making sure I have time to make videos. If you want to help me make more content just like this, you can find a link in the description. There's another track closely tied to Shion called Vector to the Heavens, which plays during her fight with Roxas at the end of 358 over two days. This piece doesn't reference Shion's theme so much as it just is Shion's theme in a new shape. Just like the real Shion who turns into this thing because... I don't know. Vector has a higher tempo and more intensity to match the stakes of the battle. It's only natural that Shion's theme would be present during a fight with Shion, but it's not just the sound of Shion. It's also the sound of her bond with Roxas, now torn apart in this last act. Roxas and Shion shared the deepest personal connection either of them had ever experienced. 
Vector to the heavens throws that in our faces as Shion forces Roxas to fight her. Roxas, I'm out of time. In Vector, there are strings behind the piano, the tempo is much higher, and the key is higher as well. The piano is also played much more forcefully, completely changing its voice. Every one of these factors intensifies the piece right away. Once we've heard most of the familiar elements of Shion's theme, Vector slows down and starts using a lot of triplets in the rhythm, which brings back some of the lyrical quality of the original piece. This is important for Kyrie's theme, which we associate with peace and wistfulness. Later, the triplets become even more prominent. Because as I said, key moments in the canon. Dearly Beloved is the first piece of music ever to be associated with Kingdom Hearts, and it means something different for all of us. For many of us who grew up with this series, it transports us back to the best parts of childhood. Cherished memories coming to mind in the middle of this tragic confrontation. What makes Vector to the Heavens stand out is that it's one of the few boss fight tracks in Kingdom Hearts that tries to make the player reluctant to fight. Usually we wield the Keyblade in battles where good and evil are kept strictly separate. This is one of the only times we think, why did things have to turn out this way? Vector doesn't feature any percussion, which is uncommon in combat music and almost unheard of in Kingdom Hearts combat music. The fight is not the focus of the track, rather the tragedy of the situation is. The musical reminders of good times make us feel the weight of what Roxas loses in this fight, even though he wins. Sion was never meant to exist. She was made solely to wield the Keyblade for the organization, but ultimately became a liability for both good and evil, so she forced Roxas to destroy her. As a puppet with no heart, Shion's story shouldn't have been a sad one, or really much of a story at all. But Roxas showed her how to feel and how to care, and they both paid the price. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But even still, Shion's theme is aptly titled, Music for the Sadness of Shion. <laughs> 